Good evening. Bill is on special assignment tonight. He'll be back tomorrow. After the gangster Sam Gincana was murdered last Thursday, authorities revealed that a federal grand jury had threatened to indict him for perjury. Now, investigators reportedly believe that Gincana demanded the crime syndicate get the Justice Department off his back. And according to this thinking, Gincana's mood convinced his mobster associates that he just might spill the beans to avoid a prison term. So, they ordered him killed. Private funeral services for Sam Gincana were held today, and John Drummond was there. Although friends and relatives of the slain gangster were on hand to pay their last respects, outfit bigwigs were conspicuous by their absence at the services held at the Montclair Funeral Home on the city's northwest side. Apparently, syndicate major domos had passed the word to their soldiers to stay away. There had been reports that Phyllis McGuire, of McGuire sisters fame, had flown to Chicago for the rites. But if Phyllis, a one-time companion of Giancana, was at the funeral, she was not seen by any reporters or police intelligence personnel. The funeral attracted a crowd of onlookers and curiosity seekers who milled around outside the parlors. Some spectators even managed to climb on top of nearby roofs to get a better view. After a 30-minute service in which newsmen were barred from attending, Giancana's body was placed in a hearse for the trip to the cemetery. More than 100 mourners, including Giancana's three daughters, joined the cortege as it wended its way through suburban Oak Park. The cortege made a farewell pass by Giancana's home at 1147 South Winona in the suburb, where the mobster was slain Thursday night. A brief chapel service was held at the Queen of Heaven Cemetery, and it was there that Channel 2 News spotted songbird Keeley Smith, a popular Las Vegas entertainer among the mourners. Following services in the chapel, several mourners lashed out verbally at the crowd of reporters and photographers. Giancana was to be buried next to his wife Angeline in the family mausoleum in Mount Carmel Cemetery. Ironically, the cemetery contains the remains of Giancana's one-time boss, Al Capone. John Drummond. Yo, this remix goes out to everybody out there that call themselves keeping it real. From yours truly, Escobar and Big R. From New York to Chi-Town, check it out now. QB, check it. Low profile, rap style, slick as new now Give the crew pounds every time we cover new ground Still surviving but here's a few down Back in the essence, I'm asking questions On the phone with jail adolescents Quiet confession, the system's applying the pressure My mind is guessing, it's living and dying a lesson But not to be obliged with the mirage of cars Take me off track, I want the guards focus on hard Laid up smoking cigars, motion and maze To bring me toast and eggs kosher Ice chokers and rooms to smoke ya My wisdom culture lives in ultra madness Devoted coach back Hope the average nigga hopes to get mad rich But what's the purpose? Only the gods can watch the earth twist I'm physically trapped down on the surface With all the crack merchants, snakes and serpents Foul jakes that search us Clowns with four pounds to say the circus Circus, circus Street They assume I'm slinging drugs Cause I'm hooded up Thought a G at night Wasn't good enough Push my luck Yo, they had a brother putting cups Luckily, made it out of court comfortably Judge said I need a job Ain't nothing coming free Could've got a one to three I try to school these shorties under me But they can't see From life to death So now we're back to where We never left the ghetto It's a damn shame Knowing it's a man's game Shorty think it's time to make your plans change All that running around Trying to chase What's already here Been there It's going nowhere Pops told me luck of luck No fear I wish some of these killings They could be prevented Whatever happens It was written Meaning God meant it But during life you put your heart in it Even though it seems we being targeted Let that brother all hit it
about to chain it, rise and start raining. Blasphemy, use a Nas name in vain. Some claim supreme being, yet they lied in his name. I tried to learn the game, and only thing I found incredible. Everything I tried to learn, see, I already knew. And it's embedded in my heart now, so I can sit back, count a stack, and play my part now. I saw my life flash in front of my eyes. He wore the skies, put a gun to me. Hungry, he went on to chastise. That's Nas, ain't it? Made it rich from entertainment, fresh while he's painted. As he told the kid he came with, my first thought was how the game flipped. Or perhaps it was somebody I smacked, drunk in a party on yak. Or was I marked for a contract for some foul act? I did a while back, or even beyond that. He got me laying face flat, saying my grace black. Woke up in a cold sweat, yo, I hate that. Nightmares, feeling real, world to real. My air like I lost in the battlefield. That's why I hit the mic with battle pill. Grab your shield, I meet Jamaica. The Queens niggas die for paper. Deep things the street dreams will take you. Bob boss Sam Giancana was killed in his West Suburban home. Who did it? Far more of a puzzle than why. Eyewitness News investigative reporter Chuck Gowdy is joining us with details. Chuck. Karen Ron Sam Giancana was born on the West Side and died not far from where he was born. Assassinated 40 years ago tonight in Oak Park. During the years in between, Giancana became one of the world's most powerful organized crime bosses. He allured Marilyn Monroe and some say got John F. Kennedy elected president. But on this night in 1975, he was cut down like the street thug that his enemies believed he was. At this house, June 19, 1975, Sam Giancana invited in a friend for sausage and peppers. Before the meat was done, the man would become Giancana's killer. The 67-year-old top hoodlum was shot in his head and neck as he fried up the evening snack. Seven shots from a silencer-equipped 22 caliber pistol. Chicago mobologist John Binder tonight says Giancana was killed by this man, his longtime driver and close confidant Butch Blasi, who had attended a small party at the Oak Park home, left, and then returned. He was there that night. Um, a car uh, registered to him or to his family, returned there that evening after everyone else had gone home. Not long thereafter, they found Giancana dead on the floor in his own basement. Do you now know who yeah. killed your uncle? Absolutely. The crime boss's nephew has told the I-team that notorious outfit member Anthony Ant Spilatro was given the assignment to rub out Giancana, a belief also held by the late suburban police chief Michael Corbett, a one-time Giancana associate. By himself, in the house, Boom, 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 see ya. He knew how to get into Sam's house without anybody seeing him. Only a few people knew how to do that, and he was one of them. He was a man who knew too much, you know, and ultimately, he had to be silenced. He was killed the night before the federal agents were to take him to Washington to testify. Giancana's namesake uncle was to appear before a Senate committee investigating CIA and mafia links to plots to kill Fidel Castro. There's been some claims that, oh, the CIA hit Sam Giancana because of either they were mad at him or to, to cover up that he had, quote, helped them in a plot against Castro. Um, that's another conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories are long on allegations, very, very short on any convincing evidence. Outfit investigators suspect the order to sil kill Sam Giancana 40 years ago tonight would have come from the bosses at the time, Joey Doves Ayupa or Anthony Joe Batters Accardo, and probably both of them. But with Ayupa, Accardo, and everyone else who had a hand in the hit also dead today, the likelihood of justice ever coming in the case of Sam Giancana seems slim at least in this lifetime. They are known right, as thanks. the JFK Papers, a collection of more than 300 letters and notes supposedly written by President John F. Kennedy. If authentic, they would provide the strongest evidence yet linking JFK to all sorts of sinister activities, from ties to the mafia to payments of hush money to his reputed lover, Marilyn Monroe. The problem is just about everyone, from document experts to the national media, has said they're fake. However, the man who says he discovered the JFK papers, Lex Cusack, insists they are real. He is so convinced that he came to us with all of his papers in hand, asking us to examine them, prove him right, and everybody else wrong. I think for someone to, um, to embark 
on a, on a, on a hoax like this would be insanity, insane. Lex Cusack is a 47-year-old former law clerk who says he was cleaning out the files of his late father, prominent New York lawyer Lawrence Cusack, when he came across hundreds of papers that, if legitimate, show that his father had secretly provided legal advice to President Kennedy from 1959 until his death in 1963. So all, all of those years, you never knew that he was giving advice to the well, president? Well, no, not to, I, didn't, I didn't know directly that he was giving advice. There was a number of times that there were, there were sort of signs that my father was always involved in something that he was not talking about that was um, kept confidential and quiet. What is in these JFK papers appears to be an extraordinary correspondence between John F. Kennedy and the lawyer Lawrence Cusack on index cards, note paper, and White House stationery. They write to each other about everything from mundane tax issues to Kennedy's efforts to keep a lid on his alleged dealings with Marilyn Monroe and the mob. Did you ever stop and say to yourself, wait a minute, I mean, this, this is hard to believe. And John F. Kennedy, in his own writing, with letters that would reveal that he had an affair with Marilyn Monroe, that he planned to buy her silence for six hundred thousand dollars and that his family had an illicit relationship with the mafia boss sam giancana did you ever stop to say whoa, whoa, whoa. yes of course i mean that's why that's why i said there's fear and trepidation it was sort of it was the subject matter was so explosive that um you have your own disbelief then what i figured the next step to do was confirm the handwriting to make sure this isn't someone else writing down a story or telling a story or, or you know, whatever. So. so Cusack says he took six of the more than 300 documents to a noted autograph expert and document dealer, Charles Hamilton, who declared those six documents to be authentic. It was then that Lex Cusack says he decided to sell his collection, and he brought it to this man, Thomas Cloud, an established dealer of gold, diamonds, and documents. I was just blown away. I mean, it was the most significant uh, find, in my opinion, in the 20th century. It's exciting to, to sit there and look at something that was penned by Kennedy talking about Marilyn Monroe or Sam Giancana or, or something, you know, of that magnitude, and you're, you're holding it and you're looking at it. It's, uh, it's a great feeling. Uh, I looked at it as, a, as the best opportunity in my career, and I've been in the business uh, 21 years now. It was an opportunity to make a lot of money, and Cloud and Cusack did just that. They sold the documents for more than six million dollars, and Lex Cusack was suddenly a wealthy man. He purchased this 1.3 million dollar home in Connecticut and a Porsche, a Mercedes, and a Chevy Suburban. He also bought this half million dollar summer home in the Hamptons on Long Island. Former CNN anchorman Bob Lozier and insurance executive Gary Vick are among the 140 people who invested in the JFK papers. I had chills running up and down my spine when he, when he was going through this. It was just, it was awesome. They were some, in some ways, many ways, the missing links as to how Kennedy dealt with Monroe, how he dealt with his father, with Bobby Kennedy, Sam Giancana. They seemed to fit into a real mosaic of history. I bought it, number one, to make money, number two, because of the history involved around it. Lex Cusack was on top of the world and preparing to make the JFK papers public. A blockbuster book on Kennedy by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Seymour Hersh with a chapter devoted to the JFK papers was in the works and a two hour documentary for ABC was in production. But then the roof fell in. ABC hired two forensic experts who examined seven typewritten documents, some bearing signatures of Marilyn Monroe and John F. Kennedy and concluded they were forged. If you look at those documents under a microscope, you can see that some letters were typed incorrectly and then lifted off the page. The problem is this system for correcting mistakes was not available on typewriters until well after Monroe and Kennedy were dead. What followed this discovery was a barrage of news stories branding the entire Cusack collection a fake. And there were suggestions that Cusack himself may have forged them. Seymour Hersh took the chapter on the JFK papers out of his book, and ABC removed any mention of the papers from its documentary. His back to the wall, Cusack offered us complete access to all the original documents. 
He said everyone had jumped to conclusions without ever examining 98% of the collection, some 700 pages of handwritten documents. I think it's, it's impossible for somebody to, to, to have forged the number of these documents, the information in the documents, and everything that had to go in behind forming these documents. Not one time in the four years that I've dealt with this have I heard there were any problems with the handwriting. Nobody's ever questioned the handwriting. I, I have never heard that one time. Cloud and Cusack were right about that. No one had questioned the handwriting because nobody had thoroughly examined more than a few documents. So we hired Dr. Dwayne Dillon, one of the top document and handwriting experts in the country, to look at all of them. He came highly recommended by investigators at the FBI and the U.S. Postal Service. He examined Cusack's JFK papers and compared them to hundreds of examples of President Kennedy's known writing. You spent a lot of time looking at this? Yes, I have spent uh, quite a number of hours. And in every case, with the, all, the variety of documents, you come to the conclusion that? That it is not the writing of President Kennedy. That they're all forgeries? Yes. We hired Dr. Dwayne Dillon, one of the most respected document examiners in the country, to evaluate the handwriting in your collection. Mm -hmm. After an extensive examination, he concluded that the writing on those documents was not the writing of John F. Kennedy. He said it was a forgery. Your reaction? I, I don't doubt that he said that. I don't doubt that he may think that. I think, I do not believe that he is a Kennedy handwriting expert. Dr. Dillon may not be a Kennedy expert, but he is a handwriting expert, and he's been doing it for 33 years. He told us he is certain the JFK papers are a forgery, and what convinced him was his discovery that certain frequently used letters in Cusack's collection didn't match Kennedy's handwriting. This is an example of one of the G's on the Cusack papers and comparing that with the actual uh, type of G which I find throughout the Kennedy writings. So you can see a clear difference in these two? Yes. When you look at those two G's, one looks fairly smooth and the other looks narrow in some places, fatter in others. What causes that? When a person attempts uh, to simulate the writing, they are, in fact, in most instances, attempting to draw the model that they see and do not show the freedom of line movement that you see in a normal handwriting. And Dr. Dillon found other inconsistencies. The J's in John Kennedy were strikingly different, as were the H's in words like Hyannis. Dillon says President Kennedy wrote with a continuous fluid stroke. But in the Cusack papers, the writing is slow and awkward, resulting in gaps within words, as you can see in this word, misunderstandings. Dr. Dillon also analyzed a letter supposedly written by Marilyn Monroe to JFK. This is a letter that says, Dear Jack, I hope you understand. I only want to make sure that my mother is taken care of. This is difficult for me. I'm afraid she will not be cared for. I will be silent on this secret of yours about Sam G and others. Thanks, M. Monroe. It's not Marilyn Monroe's signature, and the body of that letter doesn't match known uh, extended writing that I had of Marilyn Monroe. So she didn't write this? No. Good forgeries? I'd say that those are poor, poor forgeries. But Cusack and Cloud point to another man, Robert White, who they claim is one of the nation's top Kennedy handwriting experts. They say White authenticated their entire collection after looking at it under his microscope. Did you ever look at them under a, a microscope? No. I, uh, the last time I owned a microscope, I was 12 years old, and I looked at ants in my backyard. I mean, I, I, I don't, don't own a microscope. If I had one, I wouldn't know what to do with it, with a document. The fact is, Robert White is a collector of Kennedy memorabilia, of passports, wristwatches, neckties, and rocking chairs. He is not a handwriting expert. White says he merely gave an informal opinion that some of the handwriting in Cusack's collection looked like Kennedy's, and it's an opinion he no longer holds. What credentials do you have as an authenticator of handwriting? I don't have any forensic knowledge on, on uh, handwriting analysis at all. So if anyone ever suggested that you're a handwriting expert, they would be mistaken? Totally mistaken. Totally. If you're not qualified to authenticate something, then why do you think they're holding 
you up as the person who has validated their entire collection? I can only say that desperate people at some point do desperate things. Desperate, he says, because now the JFK papers may be worthless. These documents uh, now have what we call in the marketplace the kiss of death. They're forgeries. He's, he's backing off his certification. He was, he, was, he was here the other day. He was here but the other day. Why would he back off? I don't know. It's just because I'm afraid that they, they're afraid, he might be afraid of getting sued by these people that relied on his authentication. So because of that, he's changing his work? It must be. It must be. I can't think of any other. He's given no indication to us. In fact, we were told all week long that Bob White is standing behind everything he said before. Despite the evidence pointing to a forgery, Lex Cusack and Thomas Cloud are going on the offensive. They are filing a $100 million lawsuit against ABC and other news organizations, claiming that they've been defamed by reports suggesting their documents are fake. Excuse me if this, this sounds a, a little harsh, but, but isn't it bold to file a lawsuit against all these news organizations claiming that, that they've defamed you? Mm -hmm. when you have the leading document experts in this country who are unanimous in their opinion that what you have here, what you are selling, is a forgery. We have 12 other leading document experts in the country who have the experience behind the Kennedy Papers to know that, that, that say they are not. Okay? Well, let's, let's talk about the 12 document dealers and, and mm -hmm. autograph experts mm -hmm. who at one time or another authenticated this material. Mm -hmm. We talked to them, and nine of the 12 said they have withdrawn their authentications. They say they don't want their names associated with the collection anymore. Why would they do that? Nine of the 12. They're scared. Right? Um, they're, they're, they're afraid for, their, for their, you know, their businesses, their own reputation. Two of these people say that they were tricked into giving their stamp of approval. No, and they and, they and three talking. of them say they're now convinced that most if not all of your collection was forged. I mean, that's not a very good sign. No, the two that you say were, were tricked were, were not tricked. There are now just two handwriting experts on record who still believe these papers are authentic. Charles Hamilton, who is dead, and his widow Diane, who also examined some of the papers. That's not very comforting to the 140 investors who have spent millions of dollars buying up the JFK papers. When do you get to the point where you throw your hands up and say, I want my money back? I want the truth to come out. I hope if they prove not to be true that they will pay the money back. Let me ask you a very blunt question, Mr. Cusack. It's been strongly suggested by some people that you forge these documents. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty serious charge. Yes, it is. Your response to it? It's absolutely incorrect. It's absolutely incorrect. And you in no way altered or created these documents? No, I did not. Certain. Certain, <laughs> yes. Yeah, certain. Lex Cusack may be asked that same question again under oath before a federal grand jury, which is now investigating whether fraud was committed in the sale of the JFK papers. These men belong to a terrorist organization responsible for a recent wave of bombings, kidnappings, and assassinations. They are not operating out of Belfast or the Middle East. They are Cuban exiles waging a terrorist war against Fidel Castro, and their base of operations is an American city. Just minutes from this concealed arsenal are the beaches and resort hotels of Miami. No matter what happens, we are going to keep fighting against the communists who, stay, who are in my country right now. If you were asked to participate in a bombing or a kidnapping of a, a Cuban official, would you uh, do so? If it's a Cuban official, which is my enemy at the time, yes, I would do it at any time. I am ordered to do it. The major terrorist attacks last year included these targets. Lisbon, April 22nd, Cuban embassy bombed, two officials killed. New York, June 5th, Cuban mission bombed. Merida, Mexico, July 23rd, one Cuban killed. Buenos Aires, August 9th two Cuban officials kidnapped. Panama, August 18, Cubana Airlines office bombed. Trinidad, Tobago, September 1, Guyana's consulate bombed, three injured. This is only a partial list. There have been scores of attacks over the last three years, 
The most vicious occurred last October when a bomb exploded on an Air Cubana flight from Barbados to Havana. 73 people were killed. The 73 innocent men that went down in the Air Cubana crash, do you feel that that was justified? I wouldn't quote them as being innocent anyways. They were Cuban officials. They were communist officials. And any kind of communist officials, whether it's Cuban or whether it's any other nationality, playing the same game that Castro is playing should be dealt with the same way. They are terrorists now, but once these men worked for our government, they were our soldiers, though we were never supposed to know it. They have marched through 17 years of American history, from the Bay of Pigs to the assassination of John Kennedy, from the Missile Crisis to Watergate. They are soldiers who refuse to fade away. This broadcast is their story. It is our story, too. CBS reports with Bill Moyers. The CIA's secret army. This portion is sponsored by Eaton Corporation, a family of technologically related businesses responding to changing markets and the competitive stimulus of American business. Eaton. There is a stick of dynamite out there hanging on a brand new Yale padlock, just like this one. It's made by Eaton. Actually, locks are just one of a number of consumer products and services Eaton is into. They make rubber composition grips for tennis rackets and golf clubs to give you a better grip on your game. There are auto service centers that have just about everything to take better care of your car. There's an electronic igniter for gas ranges that uses 30% less gas than a pilot light and a dull shower head that saves hot water. What's a company that makes things like truck axles and forklift trucks doing in the consumer market? Eaton believes in making anything they think they can make better. Maybe even the best. For 17 years now, Cuban exiles have walked the streets of this American city, carrying with them some of the darkest secrets of our government. They include men who broke into Watergate and men enlisted by the American government to assassinate Fidel Castro. The CIA's secret war on Cuba was conceived in Washington and aimed at Havana. But wherever you begin to report the story, all roads lead here to Miami's Little Havana. My colleague George Crowell has been coming here for two years now, writing a book about the CIA's secret war. For CBS reports, he interviewed most of the important figures who know the story, and many of the terrorists. Last fall, for the first time, one of those terrorist leaders agreed to speak on camera. Armando Lopez Estrada was 20 years old when the CIA recruited him for the Bay of Pigs invasion. He continued to work for the CIA until 1963, when he joined the U.S. Army. He works in real estate today, but that is only a sideline. His real job is the terrorist war. We are trying to fight Fidel Castro and his regime around the world and inside Cuba. A, a terrorist no, campaign? That's not, we are revolutionary, we are not terrorists. And the tactics will include striking a at Cuban targets abroad. Abroad, yes. And One of our targets, or our uh, tactics attacking Cuban uh, embassy and personnel around the world. Have you had many operations recently? This month, eight. What are some of them? Um, Panama, Guatemala, Trinidad Tobago, Colombia, um, Mexico, and uh, three more are on the way. And these are bombings, or what are they? That's a top secret. They tried to assassinate a Cuban official in, in Mexico. They were trying to eliminate a communist in Mexico, a Cuban communist in Mexico. 
Well, the actions that the exiles used to make were symbolic bombs put out on the sidewalk in front of the no, embassy no, no, late no, at no, night. No, 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 on the sidewalk, inside the embassy. What happened in Trinidad Tobago two days ago? We set off a bomb inside the Guayana embassy in Trinidad Tobago, and we killed three, I mean, we injured three members of the Communist Party inside the embassy. Lopez Estrada's easy candor makes it hard to realize that he is talking about a campaign of terror whose base of operations is an American city. Hard also to realize that these are men whose tactics of secrecy and violence once were inspired and condoned by the highest levels of our government. Is this similar to the kinds of work that some of you may have done for the CIA in the 60s against Castro? Yes, sir. Same tactics? Yes, sir, we learn from them. We use the tactic that we learn from the CIA. Because we, we were trained to do everything. We are trained to set up a bomb. We were trained to kill. We were trained to free trade inside Cuba. We were trained to do everything. So we had that experience. And right now, we don't have the support of the United States government. We had to do it for ourselves. There are probably no more than two or three hundred exiles actively engaged in the violence. But in a terrorist war, even 20 or 30 determined men can be an awesome force. Like fish, terrorists need a sea to swim in, a community to sustain them. They find it here, in Miami's Little Havana. The exiles came to Miami in 1959 after Fidel Castro's revolution in Cuba. Today, there are over a half million Cubans living here. They have adapted and prospered. They have not, however, disappeared into the melting pot. You see the superficial differences everywhere. But you can only begin to understand the unique mindset of this American city when you talk to the exiles about Cuba and of the way of life they feel was stolen from them when Castro brought communism to their homeland. What it comes down to is a base of support for the terrorists. At first, hardly anyone noticed as the terrorists attacked targets abroad. But by 1974, their bombs were exploding in Miami, and it was impossible to ignore them. In the last three years, there have been over 100 bombings. In one day alone, bombs exploded in two post offices, a bank, the office of the FBI, the state's attorney, and the Dade County Police Department. Rolando Otero, responsible for bombing the Miami International Airport, is a veteran of the Bay of Pigs. He was just 17 when the CIA recruited him for the invasion. The terrorists who work with Otero say these bombings are an indication of what to expect if the United States tries to restore relations with Cuba. Equally menacing are the political assassinations. Already, seven exile leaders have been murdered, some apparently for adopting a moderate position toward Castro's Cuba. Attempts have been made on others who condemn the terrorists. Little Havana has become a community where a man expresses himself freely only at great risk. One radio reporter had his legs blown off shortly after denouncing the terrorist tactics. Max Lesnick, the publisher of Replica, the largest Cuban newspaper in Little Havana, is another journalist to be victimized by terrorism. They exploded two bombs here in Replica. A group of fascists tried to kill me in Little Havana. But anyway, this is the situation that any real newspaper man or journalist have to face when you want to openly explain your position. Well, what do you do to protect yourself? Okay, I have uh, the protection of my intelligence service in some way. And I have a lot of friends. I have enemies, but I have friends. I have a small handgun. Do you really need to have that gun? Yes, I really need for my own protection. If my enemies know that I don't have a strong way to retaliate the attacks, I will be a dead man anyway. Juan Jose Perriero was the seventh exile leader to be assassinated in Little Havana. In the months before his murder, the Miami terrorist had carried out numerous attacks on Cuban officials culminating in the October bombing of the Air Cabana flight. By now, it was widely believed that Fidel Castro, the ultimate target of these terrorist attacks, would retaliate. 
Since the man in this coffin was a Bay of Pigs veteran and one of the better known anti-Castro activists, the men at his funeral insisted that Perriero had been killed by Castro's agents. The charge is not without apparent logic, just as the faces in this crowd appear to be the faces of ordinary men. But consider their experiences. Hundreds are veterans of CIA campaigns against Cuba, in the Congo, and throughout Latin America. Several of the men here were involved in Watergate. A number of the terrorists are here, and a sizable contingent of undercover police, FBI agents, and we can presume, spies from Cuba and other Latin American countries. In Little Havana, hardly anything is what it appears to be. Most of these men consider themselves patriots, but their loyalties vary. So do their identities. One man may play many roles, and just as it's hard to find out who killed Juan Jose Perriero, it is also hard to understand what brought them all to his funeral. To trace the path, to try to understand the terrorism at work in this American city, we must travel back through the maze of America's secret policies toward Cuba, back to where it all began, with that decision in Washington to destroy the man these exiles so bitterly denounce today. The day your son gets his first car. Thanks a lot, Dad. Have fun. It brings back the moments. Bobby! Have a good time. The good times you had in all your cars, because the car is part of your life. Like the used Model A Ford you tinkered with in high school. Or maybe the Roadster you were driving in college when you knew you'd seen that special girl. The wartime Jeep you practically lived in. The Buick you borrowed from her dad for the big night to pop the big question. Heading for a new life together. And a new Plymouth to start you off. Then a son, and you were almost too shaky to drive the Chrysler. But by the time you took your daughter home in a Rambler, you knew all about it. And that Christmas present for your wife, a Chevy Impala wrapped up fancier than Santa himself. He loved it. And now he's on his own. It's his car and his future. Eaton has grown up with the automotive industry. We make precision parts for quieter, more efficient engines, controls for year-round driving comfort and cleaner air, and we're developing new safety systems that could help reduce traffic injuries and fatalities. At Eaton, we're as much a part of the car as the car is part of your life. Every year, veterans of the Bay of Pigs invasion gather in Miami to commemorate their dead and to pledge anew their determination to overthrow Fidel Castro. Sixteen years ago, when they landed on the beaches of Cuba, they were young and full of hope. Fourteen hundred brave and eager soldiers in the CIA's secret army fighting to liberate their country. Among them, Rolando Martinez, who went to work for the CIA in 1960. He was still on the agency's payroll when he later broke into Watergate. Many of them are middle-aged now, but from their ranks come a number of today's terrorists. Men of the brigade, it has now been more than 15 years since that night in April of 1961 when this brigade landed on the beaches of the Bay of Pigs. Americans were not supposed to have gone ashore at the Bay of Pigs, but the American you're looking at here led the brigade onto the beaches. He even fired the first shots at the Cuban defenders. His name is Grayston Lynch. Now a retired CIA case officer, Lynch is here today because like these Cuban exiles around him, he is still haunted by a sense of betrayal and by the need to understand what went wrong during those three bloody days in April 16 years ago. It is time now that we came to some real truths. 
No one knows more of the truth about the Bay of Pigs than Richard Bissell. As the CIA's chief of covert operations, he was the architect of the Bay of Pigs invasion. His charge from the White House was to get rid of Fidel Castro. In the year 1960, to contemplate a full-fledged communist state uh, just off our shores in the Caribbean was indeed extremely shocking. Everyone's used to this now. But that was a very shocking concept. To understand why it was so shocking, you have to remember what the America of Richard Bissell's generation had just experienced. Our worldview had been instructed by Pearl Harbor, by the rise to power of Nazi Germany, and by the seizure of Eastern Europe by the Russians. Suddenly, we saw ourselves at the barricades of freedom, the Soviet Union as the unquestioned threat to democracy. We were in what it's become fashionable to call the Cold War, and it was very easy to classify individuals and political parties and certain governments as being the bad guys, uh, others as our allies, the good guys. We talked to Bissell about a previously classified White House report on the future use of the CIA, prepared in 1954 by a group of distinguished citizens. Quote, It is now clear that we are facing an implacable enemy whose avowed objective is world domination. There are no rules in such a game. Hitherto acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the United States is to survive, long-standing American concepts of fair play must be reconsidered. We must learn to subvert, sabotage, and destroy our enemies by more clever, more sophisticated, and more effective methods than those used against us. Was that the prevailing ethic? I think that's an excellent statement of, of the prevailing view, at least the view of, of those who'd had any contact uh, with covert operations uh, of one kind or another. In other words, the nature of the enemy is such that any tactics are necessary or justified in order to thwart him and defeat him. I believe that was the view. It certainly was my view at the time. How did Castro and Cuba fit into this worldview? When Castro came to power, there was still a great deal of doubt in, in Washington and indeed in the agency itself as to whether he was uh, a committed communist or was so left with leaning as to be really beyond redemption. And I remember when Castro attended a UN meeting fairly soon after he'd come into office, was the dispatch of uh, an officer of the clandestine service who met him secretly in New York and gave him a two-hour briefing on the dangers of communism in Cuba, probably naming names. Uh, naming the names of people in Cuba who were acting for the communists, right. who might try to subvert Castro. Exactly. In Havana this year, we talked to Fidel Castro about the irony of his 1959 trip to the United States, a friendly CIA encounter in New York, but an ominous meeting in Washington with the American vice president. And I was invited to talk to Nixon. I had a talk with him about an hour and a half or so, if I'm not wrong, in my memory, about two hours I talked with Nixon. And I remember that he was interested about uh, Cuba. He asked me which were our ideas. And I explained the real objective needs Cuba had to operate uh, a, a series of social changes. I remember that Nixon looked very young. He would have about 40 and so years. He listened to me with attention. I think that with indulgence. And then we said goodbye. Later on, I found out that immediately after our interview was over, Nixon sent a memorandum to Eisenhower telling him that I was a communist and that I had to be eliminated. Well, were you a communist? Era usted comunista? Yo sí era comunista. I was a communist. I personally was a communist. Did it occur to you that the first communist society in this hemisphere would make the United States nervous? 
pero pienso que mucho más nervioso. But I think that much more nervous we could feel about it. To think that we have a, as neighbors such a powerful capitalist country as the USA. And if we can resign to that idea, why can the USA resignate to this idea? But in the atmosphere of the Cold War, the United States was not ready to accept a communist as the leader of a country just 90 miles away. Washington was increasingly alarmed by the news from Cuba. No elections, the beginnings of a mass exodus of Cuba's middle class, the seizure of American business holdings. Most alarming, the unmistakable alliance Castro was forging with the Soviet Union. If not a communist, he was at least deemed to be serving their interests. In March of 1960, President Eisenhower authorized the CIA to overthrow Fidel Castro. The agency's initial plans call for a small guerrilla operation. Hi, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. But by January 1961, Kennedy's inauguration, the CIA was proposing a massive operation built around a full-scale military invasion. The new president was faced with a terrible decision, whether to authorize or cancel the invasion. Somehow, the CIA director, Alan Dulles, convinced Kennedy that the American participation could be concealed, and he warned of grave consequences if the invasion was called off. The CIA had already recruited an exile army. Many of the men had been trained in guerrilla and commando tactics. They could not be disbanded without enormous political embarrassment. The disposal problem Kennedy faced back in 1961, we face today in Little Havana. What to do with the CIA's exile agents? According to Arthur Schlesinger, Kennedy was troubled by the plan and made this comment just before authorizing the invasion. If we have to get rid of these men, it is much better to dump them in Cuba than in the United States, especially if that is where they want to go. This is where they were dumped, a long coastline called the Bay of Pigs. What happened here is the key to the history of the secret army, all the way to Watergate and beyond. As with most battlefields, the scars of war have long vanished, but this is still a mysterious place, appropriately so. The Bay of Pigs invasion was the largest CIA operation in history, and it was begun in almost total secrecy. It was an ill-starred venture from the beginning. Fewer than 200 of the invaders were regular soldiers. The others had been engineers, musicians, doctors, artists, mechanics, clerks, clergymen, even a few journalists. Some didn't even know how to fire a rifle, and many were so trusting that they didn't believe that the United States government, which had recruited, trained, and sent them to the Bay of Pigs, would desert them once they got here. For them, it was a personal tragedy. Some lost their lives. The survivors lost their homeland. In time, they would lose their unquestioning faith in America. In the beginning, the brigade thought the CIA's plan was going to work. The first bombing raids destroyed much of Castro's tiny air force. And in the initial fighting, the brigade, armed with tanks and mortars, inflicted heavy casualties on the Cuban defenders. The exiles were so confident of victory that some even took time out on that first morning to pose for their own cameramen. The brigade's first mission was simply to seize and hold a beachhead at the Bay of Pigs. Then the agency was to fly in a group of exile leaders from Miami. The United States would declare them the legitimate provisional government of Cuba. Within a few weeks, rebellion would break out in Castro's army and throughout the island, and Castro would fall from power. Or so we hoped. To succeed, the invaders first had to control the air over Cuba. But the CIA was not to follow up its first successful airstrikes. Back in Washington, stung by charges at the UN that America was sponsoring an invasion of Cuba, and fearful that more B-26 raids would involve the US too openly, Kennedy canceled the remaining bombing runs. The air belonged to Castro. There is one American today who fully understands what Kennedy's decision meant to the brigade. The CIA case officer, Grayston Lynch, had shared with these men the certainty of air support when he led them ashore 16 years ago. We were hit just at, after daylight by his planes. Uh, they continued to hit us all morning. We lost two ships, sunk. We could not unload the ammunition for the brigade. The brigade went ashore carrying one day's supply of ammunition. That's all. And as you watched as the men were being shot at from the air without any ammunition left, and you were on the radio, 
talking to Washington, what was the message coming in to you? A lot of promises. Promises of all types of aid, which never arrived. One of the final messages that came over the radio was an offer to evacuate the exile army. But Pepe San Roman, the brigade's leader, was so sure that the promised air support was on its way that he turned the offer down. I never saw the United States lose, lose a war again. So I thought that some mistake had happened, uh, that they were still going to, to go ahead with the plan, that something wrong has uh, come up. But uh, it was unthinkable. I couldn't... <laughs> never seen the United States do anything like that and uh, it was unbelievable I it has to be something wrong and they were going to land later on and uh, even though I hated to see my country uh, being uh, taken by a foreign country uh, I thought they were going to come in and just give us a hand only until we were strong enough to continue by ourselves on the third day while still waiting for the air support the brigade ran out of ammunition. The CIA secret army was now in Castro's hands. You had 20 months in jail to try to think over what had happened at the Bay of Pigs. What kind of thoughts did you have? I was ready to grab a rifle and fight the United States. It was a bad time for me. It was a bad time for every member of the brigade, very bad. I hope so, we're crushed. For me, the government of the United States was the utmost of, uh, of everything, bigger than my father, than my mother, than God. And uh, to me, it was so low, so low a blow, to bring you in here with so many plans and so many hopes for your country. And they knew before they sent us, in my mind, that they were not going to go ahead with it. Are you saying that if the American stake had been clearly on the table, you might have gone all the way and had all that you needed to make it work? That's substantially what I'm saying, yes. If everyone had believed and admitted to himself that the U.S. would be wholly held responsible, uh, the president probably would have canceled the operation. But what in fact happened was that we had gone along for the preceding two months uh, being over careful not to have a white face on the beaches, not to have a modern aircraft in the air, not to have a gunboat uh, to protect the, the, the old small cargo ships that we were using. And we had been over careful about these things that could have made a big difference, especially the air crews, because we were trying to preserve disclaimability. We were trying to preserve something that already was lost. For America, the Bay of Pigs opened an era in which history gave back to us the opposite of what we intended. Instead of ousting Castro, we only helped to consolidate his hold on Cuba. Instead of forcing the Russians out of the hemisphere, what happened at the Bay of Pigs led us to accept their presence. It probably contributed directly to the confrontation with the Soviets and the Cuban Missile Crisis two years later. The secret war against Cuba did not end here at the Bay of Pigs. As we shall see, it was only the beginning. handling, Eaton doesn't miss a move. Eaton. Helping change happen.
Miami, 1962. The country watches as President Kennedy welcomes back the Bay of Pigs prisoners. It had taken a year and a half and a ransom of $53 million to get these men out of Castro's jails. At the time, few of us understood how Kennedy's decision to cancel the airstrikes had doomed the brigade. If we had, we might have wondered what was going on here. Why were the exiles cheering Kennedy as if he were their savior and champion? They shared a secret with him. The country thought the CIA's war on Castro had ended at the Bay of Pigs. Actually, the president had set into motion a secret war so large that almost every person in this stadium had a friend or relative or at least an acquaintance who participated in it. On this day, the brigade presented Kennedy with its flag and the exiles cheered. You can understand why when you listen to the pledge he made to them. I can assure you that this flag will be returned to this brigade in a free Havana. Kennedy's pledge was well publicized, but few Americans knew he had already committed the United States to an undeclared war on Cuba involving thousands of men and tens of millions of dollars. Dr. Ray Klein was then the deputy director of the CIA. I would say that uh, the attitude toward uh, Castro uh, throughout this period, but especially after the humiliation of the Bay of Pigs, was uh, as determinedly antagonistic as it had been toward uh, North Korea during the Korean incident. Uh, we, we visualized a situation in which Cuba was a thorn in the American side, and I don't believe there was anybody in our government who did not speak uh, disparagingly and bitterly about Castro and what he was doing to the peoples of the Western Hemisphere and how important it was to, to get rid of him, to extract Castro from the, from the uh, geopolitical picture. It wasn't just Castro. Washington feared his political allegiances and his boast that he would spread his revolution throughout the hemisphere. By now, he had declared himself to be a Marxist-Leninist and ostentatiously embraced the Soviet Union. To Washington, the sounds from Cuba were like a Cold War nightmare come true. After the Bay of Pigs, Castro denounced Kennedy as another Hitler and triumphantly ordered the destruction of the last symbols of the United States, the memorial near the American embassy in Havana was to come crashing down. To a proud young president of the most powerful country in the world, it was the ultimate humiliation, this David taunting the fallen Goliath. Uh, both of the Kennedy brothers, and particularly Bobby, felt they had been booby-trapped at the Bay of Pigs and that it became uh, a constant preoccupation, almost an obsession, uh, to uh, write the record somehow. And uh, I remember what people have said about uh, the Kennedys uh, in other contexts, that they learned from their father, uh, don't get mad, get even. And so the Kennedys commissioned the secret war. They even recruited some of the CIA's first warriors. Armando Lopez Estrada, the terrorist leader we met earlier, escaped from Cuba after the Bay of Pigs. Now, back in the United States, he received a call from the White House. I was in my house when I received a phone call from one uh, member of the White House, and they asked me to buy fancy clothes and everything I needed and take a plane to Washington because the president wanted to talk to me. Were you angry at the United States and at President Kennedy? At the Kennedy? moment, yes. At the moment, very did, angry. Did you tell them that? I tell them. I did. Because we, we wanted to know we were, why we were abandoned inside Cuba. Another man who escaped with Lopez Estrada was Roberto San Roman, brother of the imprisoned brigade commander. He, too, went to Washington to meet the Kennedy brothers. Uh, he uh, took us to his home that same day, and he had a uh, party. This is Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy at Hickory Hill. That's right. And uh, he had uh, his sons and daughters there, you know, two 
create an atmosphere, a family atmosphere, and we really needed that because we were morally destroyed at that time. In one of my, uh, my interviews with uh, Bobby Kennedy, he himself uh, asked me if I wanted to uh, work against uh, Fidel Castro regime again. Uh, of course, I said yes, immediately. And then he called one man, one man. As soon as I saw that person, uh, I became very happy because I met him on the Bayus Peak. His name was Gray. Gray, of course, was Grayston Lynch. At that time, we trained uh, in the Keys, in the Florida Keys. We used to uh, uh, come ashore from a mother ship and, and in a rubber boat with a, a motor that we painted black and, you know, and with a silencer and everything and land uh, on the shore and, and then walk through the mangrove and through the backyards of private homes and everything, you know, this kind of training in the middle of uh, civilization, you know. The commando strikes began just weeks after the Bay of Pigs. Sugarcane fields were set ablaze. Later, the attacks grew more ambitious, aimed at major industrial targets. But it was not just commando strikes. The CIA was already beginning an elaborate plan to destroy the Cuban economy. And some rather elaborate uh, clandestine operations were laid on, which I remember uh, involving uh, contamination of uh, uh, commodities being shipped to or out of Cuba, uh, the interference with the uh, uh, machinery, uh, it's called subtle sabotage. You know, if you, if you send a piece of machinery to a country which looks great and, and yet the ball bearings are square instead of round so that in a few months it chews itself up. That's subtle sabotage rather than as distinct from sort of putting a booby trap in the machine that blows up immediately. So there were, there were a number of operations of subtle sabotage, some of them uh, rather successful. But that's the kind of thing that uh, the United States had in mind at that time. Seven months after the Bay of Pigs, President Kennedy traveled to Seattle to deliver a major foreign policy address at the University of Washington. He talked about the rules of conduct that limited the United States in its fight against communism. We cannot, as a free nation, compete with our adversaries in tactics of terror, assassination, false promises, counterfeit mobs and crises. We cannot, under the scrutiny of a free press and public, tell different stories to different audiences, foreign and domestic. So President Kennedy spoke to the nation on November 16, 1961. But he was also at that time approving Operation Mongoose, the code name for the next stage of the secret war against Cuba. The name was romantic, Operation Mongoose, but the tactics were not. They included those very things the president had just said America did not do. Until Vietnam, there had never been anything in the American experience quite like the war on Cuba. To begin with, it's against the law for the CIA to operate in the United States. But to direct its secret army, the agency established here in Miami the largest CIA operation in the world. Certainly an anomaly. You ran it as if it were in a foreign country, but it was on American soil. That's right. It is an anomalous... Uh, case of a CIA operation, which if I had to justify it in terms of basic uh, doctrine and charter, I would find rather difficult. We asked Dr. Klein how large that CIA station was. If I had to guess, I would, I would say six or seven hundred uh, American staff officers. Now, uh, that means people who are administering and running things and... Uh... The figures bear repeating. Six or seven hundred CIA officials in Miami secretly working to overthrow Fidel Castro. But that's a very large group of American staff officers. That does not include uh, the Cubans with whom these people were dealing. Most estimates put the number at about 2,000. Rolando Martinez, whom we'll meet again at Watergate, was one of those Cuban agents. He made over 350 clandestine missions to Cuba. We talked about those operations with Martinez and one of his early case officers, Grayston Lynch. This was uh, 
spread over um, many years that uh, we had other captains that met, I don't know, maybe 100, 150. We had uh, people who went inside of Cuba on operations 50, 60, 70, 80 times. It's just a long war. I went to the ocean. I was not a professional. I was not a Navy man. I was not even made for this kind of a job. We were made by people like Gray. I did not know a stop war from port and for this turn. And we might look after 354 missions that I enjoy those missions. That I liked to be setting up the 57 recoilless rifle, the 11th caliber 50 that we carry around, the donut explosive to protect ourselves if we were chasing. I, I mean, we have, like me, doctors, attorneys, working in this kind of a job. We were made by you people in the hope that our effort was going to be rewarded gaining our freedom. Martinez and Lynch took us on a tour of some of their early bases in Miami. Well, this was one of our safe house, one of the ones that start bringing hope to us again. You can see it was in a better neighborhood. So we thought at that time that we really have the backing of the whole country. It was uh, big. It was the dream house for this kind of operation. Rolando, you would bring your guns and gunboats right into that garage there? Yes, we used to load all our equipment. And no one ever saw that you were doing anything suspicious? No, not really. <clears throat> you have to remember that the people were in sympathy with us from what we were doing. So if they had any suspicions or anything, they just... Um, Kept quiet and more or less to good luck. And so the gunboats, dressed as pleasure craft, traveled down the canal on their way to Cuba. When we were around here, we just were expecting to see the car of our CO parking right in the corner <laughs> to say, like, uh, the last goodbye. Every time Martinez and his Cuban agents left this canal carrying 50 caliber machine guns, they were clearly violating the country's neutrality acts. At times, they were a problem for an unsuspecting Coast Guard. What would you say if, you, if they stopped you? Well, in the beginning, I was a stubborn. Uh, I say, I have nothing to say, and you are not allowed to come aboard. Contact your boss and tell it what boat you are stopping. Later, a more acceptable arrangement was worked out with the Coast Guard. The way we're in advance, given 30 or 31 different words for every day. In a sealed envelope. One in a sealed envelope, and you open that envelope the day that correspond to the one that you were running. And if anyone has stopped you, you just say Alpha, Omega, Kennedy. Sometimes it would take the men almost a week to get back from Cuba to this canal. Gray, what would you talk about when you met your boys when they came back from a raid? Well, it was a regular debriefing. They would explain that in chronological order exactly what happened. So you just get ready for the next one? Routine. But how was it possible to launch such provocative operations from Miami? For one thing, the agency created a network of safe houses to hide its activities. There were hundreds of them stretching from Miami to Key West. These beach houses in different locations up and down the Keys served as way stations for the CIA's commandos. But there was no way to conceal all the operations of more than 2,000 American and Cuban agents with their gunboats traveling down this coast. How then did they do it? Well, they had a lot of help from the Customs, the Coast Guard, the FBI, the Internal Revenue Service, and from much of the Miami and South Florida establishment. Seducing the press was critical. Two senior CIA officials told us they had explicit arrangements with the press here to keep their secret operations from being reported, except when it was mutually convenient. Nineteen separate police departments had to be enlisted so they wouldn't arrest gun-toting exile agents. Bankers were needed to extend credit to CIA men running phony businesses and using fake names. And the need for cooperation stretched down the line. 
It amounted to a massive conspiracy to violate the country's neutrality act and other federal, state, and local laws as well. In, in the circumstances of the time, uh, with uh, the kind of uh, thinking we've been discussing at the top of the government, no one questioned the, the wisdom or the propriety of such activity. The question was whether you're doing enough to carry out the objectives of the U.S. government. This is a sample of the pressure. Robert Kennedy at a meeting of the Cuban Task Force. The overthrow of Castro has the top priority in the United States government. All else is secondary. No time, money, effort, or manpower is to be spared. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara recalling the mood of those times. We were hysterical about Cuba at the time of the Bay of Pigs and thereafter. General Edward Lansdale Robert Kennedy's man brought in to run the secret war. We are in a combat situation where we've been given full command. One proposal submitted to the White House by Lansdale's task force called for the use of biological and chemical warfare against the Cuban sugar workers. The general spelled out his proposals, 32 in all, in a 1962 memorandum to the attorney general. It concluded with this statement. My review does not include the sensitive work I have reported to you. I felt you preferred informing the president privately. Here comes the future to have a look at the past. In this museum, they'll see some of man's brightest ideas, inventions, machines that helped bring us to where we are today. But what about tomorrow's innovations? What new wonders will be on display in these halls in the year 2000? No one can say for sure. But there are people and companies who do more than guess about the future. One is Eaton Corporation, where the big idea is anticipating change and helping change happen. Today, Eaton is committed to the change and the innovations that will help shape tomorrow's world his world. Tomorrow's transportation, automation, security, construction, materials handling, even tomorrow's leisure time. Look forward with Eaton, helping change happen. In 1911, this kind of thing used to happen all the time. So Joe Eaton and Viggo Torbenson started building axles specially designed for trucks. That was a breakthrough, but in American business, one breakthrough is never enough. You always have competitors trying to catch up. Your customers demand more, bigger payloads, higher speeds, and you do it, or someone else will. So trucks have come a long way, a lot of it on Eaton axles. And with Eaton brakes, air conditioning, and transmissions, Today, Eaton has expanded into many other businesses, but the same principle applies. We have to keep topping our own improvements or our competitors will. In American business, that's the way it is. September 1975. The Senate Intelligence Committee displays an assassination device designed by the CIA's Technical Services Division. Back in the early 1960s, Americans made a hero of James Bond, the fictional English spy with his 007 license to kill. But in real life, we thought weapons like this one were employed only by the totalitarian regimes Bond was trying to neutralize. We learned something new about ourselves in the course of this Senate investigation. Our secret war on Cuba included assassination as a weapon of foreign policy. How did you feel when you first learned that the CIA was trying to overthrow you? It was so long ago that I, I, I almost do not remember. <laughs> but uh, it seems to me like uh, an evident truth. It has been a real truth since the very beginning of the revolution. And for the North Americans, the reports about the plans of the attempts against our lives were apparently something new. Have you read this report? Ha leído usted este informe? The Senate report. 
most of, of it I've read, and especially things regarding Cuba. And I can tell you that uh, here you find only part of the plans directly organized by the CIA in order to matter leaders of the Cuban Revolution. Fidel Castro says there were 24 CIA assassination attempts. The Senate Intelligence Committee has documented eight. The CIA began to plot Castro's assassination during the Eisenhower administration. But in the early weeks of the Kennedy administration, the agency moved to streamline its assassination capability. The man in charge was Richard Bissell, then chief of covert operations for the CIA. He is speaking publicly about this subject for the first time. At one time, the CIA organized a small department known as Executive Action, which was a permanent assassination capability. How well, did it that wasn't just an assassination capability. It was a capability to discredit or get rid of people. But it, it, it could have included assassination. The CIA's first plans for getting rid of Castro aimed at discrediting him. By impregnating a box of the Cuban leader's cigars with LSD, the agency hoped Castro would make a speech while under the influence and discredit himself publicly. Then there was the plan to dust his shoes with the powder that would cause his beard to fall out. The CIA thought this would rob Castro of his charisma. But for one reason or another, such schemes were abandoned. And in August 1960, the CIA turned to assassination. Richard Bissell believes that CIA Director Alan Dulles briefed both President Eisenhower and his successor, John Kennedy. But Bissell acknowledges that even he does not know for certain. The presidential method of granting authorization for sensitive operations like this was designed to be enigmatic. A president typically says that he wants to get rid of someone. And obviously he and everybody else involved would much rather get rid of someone in a rather nice way. But if the emphasis is on getting rid of him, whatever, by whatever means have to be used, uh, this I would have taken as an authorization. You're not the first person to tell us that about this curious way that uh, CIA officials had in briefing the president using circumlocution, as you said, and euphemisms. What was the reason for talking in this code? I think it's very simple. I think it is the duty of a good intelligence officer to make sure that he doesn't do anything that the chief of state doesn't want done or doesn't approve of. And secondly, that he conduct his conversations with the chief of state in such a way that the chief of state can never be proved to have explicitly authorized certain kinds of actions. Came to be known as deniability. Correct. A chief of state must, in, if he has a well-run intelligence service, be able to say that he knew nothing of a particular operation. It was under Richard Bissell's command, just after Eisenhower had instructed the CIA to remove Castro from power, that the agency undertook its most highly criticized operation, the Mafia contract to assassinate Castro. The man who contacted the Mafia for the CIA was Robert Mayhew, one of the mystery men of our times. During World War II, he was an FBI agent, then a private detective, performing special contracts for the CIA. At the time of his recruitment to engineer the Mafia plot, he was just beginning as Howard Hughes, chief troubleshooter. I felt that we were involved in a just war. And I agreed to make the contact. The men he recruited for the CIA were John Rosselli, the Las Vegas mafioso, Sam Giancana, the Don of Chicago, Santo Traficante, the Don of Tampa. I personally am convinced that they agreed to join the assignment truly because they thought that they were making a contribution to the national security of our government. The contradictions in this story seem endless. The mafia plot begun in the Eisenhower administration continued until early 1963. By that time, Robert Kennedy was supervising the CIA's secret war from his attorney general's office. He was also directing a war on organized crime, and Giancana and Traficante were on his special list of mafia figures
targeted for prosecution. Thus, while one government agency was trying to put these men in jail, another had already enlisted them to kill Fidel Castro. The president's brother was briefed about the mafia plot in 1962 by the CIA. He may have thought the plot had been discontinued. Still, his response seems instructive. Kennedy issued no orders or guidelines prohibiting such activities in the future. Only this proviso. I trust that if you ever try to do business with organized crime again, with gangsters, you will let the Attorney General know. You say you think now it was a mistake, but at the time you apparently thought it was justified. I did. Why do you now think that it was a mistake? Mainly because I think we should not have involved ourselves with the, the mafia. Uh, I think uh, an organization that does so is losing control of the security of its, of its information. I think we should have been afraid that we would open ourselves to blackmail. If I read you correctly, you're saying it's the involvement with the mafia that disturbed you and, and, and not the need or decision to assassinate a foreign leader. Correct. Do you have any second doubts about that? Well, I don't have any serious second doubts uh, in the context of the times when these decisions were made, except perhaps for, for one, a doubt or, or a, a proviso. Uh, I believe that an operation of that kind should never be undertaken unless it can be done so in the deepest, most permanently impenetrable secrecy. It's all right if it isn't disclosed? Ever. Or suspected. May I, I want to add a little because... Anything you want to. Obviously, this is something that should not be done unless it's virtually the last resort. And I not only think that the use of the Mafia was a mistake, I think we were a little too free and easy then in our whole attitude toward the possibility of assassination. John McCone, former director of the CIA. It was almost common for one person or another to say, we ought to dispose of Castro. Richard Helms, former director of the CIA. If killing him was one of the things that was to be done, that was within what was expected. Admiral Arleigh Burke, National Security Council. Any plan for the removal of Cuban leaders should be a package deal, since many of the leaders around Castro were even worse than Castro. General Edward Lansdale, Chief of Operation Mongoose. Gangster elements might provide the best recruitment potential for actions against Cuban officials. This is a partial list of the testimony of record. This portion was sponsored by Eaton Corporation, a family of technologically related businesses responding to changing markets and the competitive stimulus of American business. Eaton.